Well, good morning, friends, and welcome again to Christ Church. My name is Michael, and I am one of the pastors around here. And uh, one of my main responsibilities is to stand up in front of you in times like this and open up God's Word and talk about what's in there. And it's something that I love to do, and it's sometimes uh, something that is pretty easy to do, and at other times it's something that is pretty difficult to do. And today, I just want to kind of acknowledge right out of the gate that we're talking about some difficult things today. I thought about sort of trying to ease our way into it, but it felt a little bit inauthentic, to be honest. So I just want to be up front and let you know we're going to talk today about marriage. And we're going to talk today about divorce. These are difficult things to talk about in a room like this. And if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Matthew 5, because that's where we'll be. And I just want to acknowledge, man, it's virtually impossible. In a setting like this, when I look at all of your faces, many of which I know, others of which I don't, but hopefully will someday, I know that there are different stories in this room. I know that there are different experiences in this room. I know that there are different pains in this room. I know that you're in different places in this room with respect to this, this, this reality of divorce and of marriage. And I know that it would be impossible for me to speak in such a way that directly connects in the perfect way to all of the situations that you're wrestling with. And we always rely on the Holy Spirit to fill up where our words are lacking. But I feel, feel extra keenly today, to be honest with you, about the need for the Holy Spirit to take the words of Scripture and hopefully my words and explaining what Jesus meant when he said what he said and connecting it to the situations that you are living through, maybe personally or somebody around you. A divorce. And divorce has never been an easy issue for me. Probably in large part because divorce is not an issue for me. You say divorce, you're talking about both of my parents, one of whom raised me. You're talking about my in-laws. You're talking about one of my siblings. You're talking about the parents of many of my students. You're talking about way too many of my close friends, many of my colleagues in ministry when you say divorce. And I hesitate even to mention individuals, even without their names, but that's part of the unique shame and pain, pain of divorce, is that you can find yourself in other sorts of situations. You can know the things that the Bible talk about, and you, maybe the Bible says don't do, or you, you, you do them, or it happens around you, and yet you can kind of hide it, you know what I mean? Like you can keep it private. You can put on your Christian face and go to church, and nobody's any the wiser. But with this issue, it's a little bit more difficult to hide, you know? It's a little bit more public, a little bit more out in the open. And it's tough, and I just want to assure those of you who are divorced or have been divorced, I'm not going to beat you up today. I'm not going to sit up here and throw verbal spears at you. I don't think that would be God's intent. I don't think that's what would be appropriate to do with the text. I'm going to try to talk in such a way that is beneficial to all of us. And actually, today's text is about divorce, but it's not even directly addressed to divorced people. I think Jesus is mostly talking to married folks and single folks who may become married about marriage, talking to folks and communities of people who sometimes are in marriages but kind of want out of marriages, and what do you do with that? And, and, and really, his words are mostly direct, directed to all of us generally and to those who are or will someday be married about the nature of marriage, and he does so by talking about divorce, and it's just, I think, a subtle but important thing to keep in mind, and when we, when we deal with this or talk about this in a setting like this or even just across a coffee table or whatever, it's really easy to fall to one side or the other. I kind of feel like maybe if it wouldn't have been distracting, I should preach this sermon from a balance beam, you know, try to not fall off on one side or the other because it's just so easy to either be too lenient and to say, listen, I know what the Bible says, but always, always caution flags, I know what the Bible says, but... Listen, like, it's just hard. Like, you just, gotta, you just gotta do what makes you happy in this situation. We find ourselves sometimes almost saying some things like this or, or being too lenient on this issue and pretending that the Bible isn't as clear as it is. Or on the other side, we can be too strict and say, listen, man, you gotta muscle up, buttercup, because this is what the Bible says, and I'm gonna hit you with it, and I'm gonna hit you with it again, and I'm gonna keep hitting you with it until I don't need to hit you with it anymore, you know? We can be too lenient or too strict, and, and this is dangerous. Let me just, let's just do this to kind of set the, set the tone properly. If you came today with your spouse, I want you to kind of look at them if you're not with your spouse, like if you would, right? I can see you, so I know if you're doing this or not. <laughs> look at them, and if you're not with the spouse, or you don't have, you're single, or you're here alone, or whatever, look at somebody else around you, or you can just look at me for that matter, but just look at each other real quick. Here's what I want you to say, all right? First thing I want you to say, if nobody, everybody's going to say it. If you got nobody else to say it to, say it to me, but uh, y'all aren't doing it. Some of y'all aren't looking. I, uh, you look, I think that you're probably married based on how you're sitting. <laughs> so look at each other. I'm just kidding, uh, but for real. And, um, and say, here's what I want you to say. You're not perfect. Some of y'all enjoyed that too much. And uh, keep looking at each other because we're not quite done. And now, I'll, I'll, here's what I want you to say now. I'm not either. All right, now that we got that taken care of, we can just rest easy a little bit. Or at least breathe. Like, that's so important, honestly, in the context of a marriage to acknowledge these facts that neither of us is perfect and in the context of a community, 
Man, I wouldn't do this because it would sort of single people out in inappropriate ways, but I love to put like the married folks on one side and those who have been or are divorced on another side, like face to face and, and just do the same thing. I'm not perfect. Hey, guess what? I'm still married, but I'm not perfect. And, and on the flip side, you would say, I'm not either. Like this is, this is how we, I think, need to approach this issue um, because it's confusing. Divorce is confusing because marriage is confusing. Marriage is confusing because love is confusing. And if your view of love comes from Hollywood or the latest popular paperback, no wonder divorce seems like a sensible option. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's hard to know where to go. Sometimes it's hard to know where to start. And yet on this, at least, we have an answer because we start with Jesus. Matthew chapter 5. Open your Bibles. Matthew 5. Short text, verses 31 and 32. Super short. Just a couple of verses. And I want to read them and talk a little bit about what's going on around them and see if we can't gather wisdom from them for where we are today. Matthew 5, 31 and 32. Uh, I'm going to read, be, though it's a short text, there's a translation issue that I usually try not to mess with this stuff unless it's necessary. I think it's necessary this time. So I'll point it out as we go, and then I'll kind of read it all, all the way back through after I butcher it up a little bit. It says, it has been said, verse 31, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. This is the tradition. Jesus is quoting says, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and here's where my Bible says, makes her the victim of adultery. That's the wrong translation. Some older ones say, causes her to become an adulteress. Also the wrong translation. The simplest one is the right one. It should say, causes her to commit adultery. Jesus is saying, anybody who divorces your wife, except for sexual immorality, causes her to, become, to commit adultery. She remarries. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So like I said, I, I don't like... Translation fixes because it makes it all butchery, but let me read it again now the proper way. Here's what Jesus says. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, there you have it. Two verses. We're going to stay pretty focused on these verses today. Because there's a lot of different places we could go, a lot of other passages we could bring in. We're going to stay really focused on hearing what Jesus has to say to us from this verse. There are other parallels like Matthew 19 and Mark 10 that I'd love to talk about. But here's the beauty of being in a series like the one we're in. It's called The Gospel is the series we're in where we're walking through the life of Jesus front to back chronological order. We'll come to the other text when we get there. And we'll talk about what's said there when we get there. But for now, let's focus on what's said here. On what Jesus means with this strange teaching about the nature of divorce and adultery and marriage and what in the world are we supposed to even do with this? There is one passage that I need you to hear uh, because it's the kind of background for this. You'll notice he said, it was said, and then anybody who divorces his wife must give a certificate. He's quoting or alluding to Deuteronomy chapter 24. And I'm going to read a few verses from Deuteronomy 24 because we need to understand something about the debates happening in their day so that we can grab the truth from what Jesus says in context and apply it to our context. So Deuteronomy 24, here's the first four verses. Moses says, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her. It's a key phrase. We'll come back to it in a second. And he he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That's a technical term in this context. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. And so you have this Old Testament passage, which actually... Actually, it's not even about the legitimacy of divorce. It's about saying, if you're going to send your wife away with a certificate, and then she remarries, and then that doesn't work out, you don't get to bring her back. It's a way of protecting the sanctity of marriage. You can't just play willy-nilly games with it and act like it's no big deal. It's a way of protecting the woman, like the certificate protects the woman from the charge of adultery. Well, you're with another man. I thought you were married to him. No, he, he divorced me. Here's the certificate. Here's my proof that I'm not committing adultery. That's the idea of the certificate, was to protect the vulnerable. And in a lot of these texts, you'll notice that they're geared more toward the male. I think that's a cultural thing, or not I think, that's a cultural thing. In that world, it was mostly the males who initiated divorce. Now, by Jesus' day, there was some, I don't want to use a good word like equality to describe this type of thing, but equality where both men and women could initiate divorces. So some of the parallel passages in other gospels address men and women. I think we should hear them all as addressing all of us. Whoever can initiate a divorce, that's who this text is addressed to. And in that culture, that's all of us. Now, in in their world, Jesus says, you've heard it said. 
Anybody who can divorce a woman, you just got to give her a certificate. And there was a debate about this. The traditional view on this uh, was a conversation point at the time. There were some rabbis who were really lenient and said, you can divorce a woman for any reason. And, and it all comes back to this meaning of the phrase, if you find something indecent about her, what does that mean? And they would say, well, it means if you don't like something, if you don't like the way she cooks, if you don't like the way she looks, if you find somebody better, if you see greener grass, like you can divorce her, just give her a certificate, but you can divorce for any reason. And the more strict rabbis would say, actually, no, you can't divorce for any reason. This is referring to sexual infidelity, unfaithfulness in the marriage. If your wife is unfaithful to you in some way, then you can divorce. So they had their differing opinions on the legitimate grounds for divorce, but what they agreed on was that as long as you give a pink slip, as long as you write a certificate, you're abiding by the law. You're good. That's the traditional view. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, it was said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. And as always, Jesus offers a better way. We've seen this in the Sermon on the Mount multiple times. So you have like the worldly way and then the, and then the religious way and then there's Jesus' way, which is different from both. And on, on all matters, the worldly way, typical way of the world is you kind of do what you want so that you can have more fun than everybody else. I mean, that's kind of the way the world often works. You do whatever you want, whatever you think is pleasing so that you can have as much fun as possible. The religious way looks at that and says, oh no, that's bad. No, what you do is you follow the rules so that you can feel superior to everyone else, you know? No, oh, point your finger. Jesus looks at both and says, how about instead of either one of those, we follow my way, which is to become the people God made you to be, and so increase the joy of yourself and those around you. We've seen Jesus do this with different teachings already. That's what he does with this one. So he's going to take this traditional view, and he's going to bring a little bit of a reality check to it. Saying, listen, your interpretations aren't as good as you think. The differences aren't as big as you think. So on the divorce issue, the worldly way says, just send her away. Who cares about being good? Who cares about being righteous? If she's not making you happy, then abort the mission. Get her out of here. Go, whatever. Just send her off. And the religious way says, oh, no, we, we would never do that. Now, if you don't like her, you can send her away, but make sure you give her a pink slip. Like, if you don't want to be married, that's fine. Just make sure you fill out the paperwork. That's the religious way. I mean, there's, there are, if you do this, then you're a good person, then you're righteous, then God's pleased with you. And Jesus is back here saying what is fairly obvious from an outsider perspective. Y'all aren't as different as you think. You guys aren't that much better than them. So this is what you think God had in mind when he gave you these rules to protect marriage and to avoid adultery. He's like, are you serious? No, like this, it, your interpretation, oh religious folks, is not as godly as you would imagine. So here's a better way. Reality check, then a better way. Reality check, you're both wrong. Better way, stay married. Stay married. It's interesting because the, the therefore, the action point in this passage is implicit. It's not actually stated. Usually Jesus gives an action point that's kind of surprising, so he states it very clearly. I don't know if you remember the anger text from a couple weeks ago, but he says, you know, you've heard that it was said, anybody who murders is subject to judgment, don't murder. But I'm telling you, even a contempt attitude is subject to judgment. So your interpretation is not as good as you think. And then he says, therefore, go and be reconciled. If you've got a conflict with someone, try to work it out. He'll usually be very clear. Therefore, go and do this. Therefore, go and do that. Here, he just leaves it implicit because it's fairly clear. Instead of pursuing divorce, stay married. Are there exceptions? Yes, there are exceptions. I want to represent the scriptures well. Yes, there are situations in which God himself would say, I don't like this, but a divorce is preferable in this situation, or at least allowable, I'll say Yes, there are exceptions. Jesus says right here, adultery is an exception. Now, does that mean that if adultery has occurred, divorce is a necessity? No, it actually doesn't. That's what the rabbis would say. Jesus doesn't say that. And I had a couple come up to me after the first service. She said, I want you to tell us the other services. Usually when people say that, I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. What are you going to say? But I'm actually going to do it. She said, listen, 25 years ago, I had a legitimate grounds for divorce. And I, was, I, had, I had filled the paperwork. I was about to turn it in, but Jesus just said, you need to be more, I need you to wait. I'm not, ready, I'm not ready to let this thing go. I don't want you to let this thing go. And she's like, Jesus, no, like you said I could do it now. She's like, yeah, but I don't want you to. And so she stuck it out. 50 years. They just celebrated 50 years. She said it can be done. So marriage can be redeemed. But exceptions, yes. Jesus says adultery. Is if, if, if someone has so acted in such a way that they have killed the marriage, then you can file the paperwork and acknowledge their decision. Paul adds another one in 1 Corinthians 7, abandonment. If you're living with someone who, uh, he's talking about not a believer, who says, listen, I'm done with you. Like, I don't want to live with you. I'm just going to leave. Then if they leave, you can go ahead and acknowledge, like, listen, this is over. They killed it. I'm just going to go ahead and make it official. I think, personal opinion, I think abuse fits this criteria. 
But I think abuse fits the biblical criteria for an exception to always staying married. I do. I think it's the same sort of situation as the others. Now, let me just say this. I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but this one's worth it. If you're in, the, if you're in a situation where you're being abused, I'm going to tell you right now, leave immediately. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying get a divorce. I'm saying get out of the house. Get out of the house and demand change and wait for that change. Be patient. As patient as God has been with you, wait for it. But do, never, I think, would Jesus say, hey, stay in the situation. I think he'd say, listen, this can be redeemed too. Watch me work. I can, I can fix this too. But, but get out. And if you're a man, if you're a man and you've been abusing your wife, and you put her in a frame of mind where she doesn't have the capacity to step up, I'm asking you to step up the level of courage in your life and to say after church today, we both know what I've done. I'm going to get out of here for a while. I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving the kids. I'm not walking out on this, but I need help and I'm going to get it. That's, I think, what should happen. But too much, again, tangent needs to be said. Back to the point, are there exceptions? Yes, there are exceptions. But hear me well when I say to focus on the exceptions is precisely to miss the point of what Jesus is saying. Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says in his analysis of this passage that to think about exceptions and to search for a situation where divorce is okay is actually wrong. So it's actually sinful against the spirit of this text. Another one of my favorite writers on scripture, John Stott, in his description of what Jesus is saying here says to be preoccupied with the grounds for divorce. So to be, so what I'm going to think about is, can I find a way out? To be preoccupied with the grounds for divorce is to be guilty of the very Pharisaic, that's the Pharisees, Pharisaic attitude which Jesus condemned. Jesus never lets us hide in the exceptions. He never lets us hang out in exception land. He doesn't. Now, if Jesus were speaking one-on-one -on -one to a person in a difficult situation, I think he would tailor his wisdom to that person's situation. I do. But here he's laying out the general rule. The general rule that pulls us away from our search for an exception and calls us back to God's design. And the general rule is stay married long beyond the point when many people would cash it in and call it quits. Stick it out. Clearly, he's not messing around. He says, listen, if you divorce someone, they go get married, it's like adultery is happening. What? Jesus, this is crazy. Are you serious? He says, yeah, God does, if, if your divorce is illegitimate, God doesn't accept it as legitimate. The piece of paper doesn't matter to him. What? Like, what are you saying, Jesus? And this is where sometimes people get a little bit crazy and they're like, well, now I'm remarried, so should I divorce this person? Go back and try to like, should we both double divorce? And then, no, let me just say no. Like, why would you, why would you say, oh, here's, what, here's how to fix this, more divorce. So no, <laughs> that's not his point. That's a misunderstanding of the nature of what he's saying. What he's saying, it's like last week when he said, you know, cut your hand off, gouge your eye out, because it's better for you to avoid sin handless and eyeless than to keep your parts and go into hell. That's what he said. And here he's pretty intense, same time. He says, listen, I'm raising the stakes as high as they possibly can. Stay married. Don't trifle with marriage because it's not to be trifled with. That's Jesus' point. How? How? How can we do this? Man, this text seems sort of um, minimalist on, on advice moving forward. Well, what do we do? And I think if we sort of read this text in context, we'll actually find the answer to the question, how do kingdom people stay married? I got two things to say on this. And I got to be honest with you, there's a, I have a little bit of anxiety about it. Not because I don't like what I'm saying, not because I don't think it's true, not because I don't think it's helpful, but because I have this fear that, that when I tell you what I think needs to be said, you're just going to roll your eyes. Maybe that works for you, buddy, but not me. Not in my world. It's not going to cut it. You ever notice we tend to think we're the experts on how hard marriage is and what won't work, you know? People give us advice, well, that's never going to work. I remember one time I was younger in my ministry, I was first starting out, and I think I'd probably been married three or four years. I had this conversation, and I was asked to do some teaching, some writing on marriage, and I did some stuff. And, and one of these guys was kind of poking fun at me. He was like, oh, what do you know, you know, just a baby. And I'm like, okay, what are you going to do? And he's like, listen, I've been married three times. I've learned a thing or two. You should listen to me. <laughs> Thank you. you. That's what I'm like. I'm like, are you, are you going to laugh now? Because it sounds like you're telling a joke. You know what I mean? But we, th we do this sometimes. We do it with age too. And I'll admit I'm guilty. Anytime I'm talking to somebody who's been married significantly less years than me, I'm like, baby, you don't know. That's sweet. That's cute, you know. But you don't know. Some of y'all feel that way, right? I've been married 13 years. 13 years. Some of you are like, 13 years, that's nothing. You're just getting started. I know. I know. Do I know enough? To say what needs to be said about marriage? No, probably not. But I do know Jesus, and I think he does. How about we listen to the one who's literally never broken a promise ever? That'd be a good idea. 
right? Like, how about we heed the wisdom of an eternal one who knows everything about every marriage ever and in whose love, like, his love is what marriage was made to be a reflection of. So probably his voice is the one that we should give our ear to. And I think if you do, if you read this in context to this Sermon on the Mount, you'll see two things. First of all, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. That's point one. Follow Jesus. Where do you find this teaching about marriage? You find it in the Sermon on the Mount. What is the Sermon on the Mount? It's a call to follow Jesus. I think Jesus is saying, follow me. Let me be your teacher. Listen to me. Obey me. The secret to doing marriage well is becoming a person who hears Jesus' voice and obeys it every time. That's what it is. Is this all we got to say? No, there's more, but it's where we got to start. That this vertical relationship is the thing that stabilizes all the horizontal relationships. And this is the point at which if you're saying, I'm not married, it doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. Because same thing's true in every relationship. We're talking about marriage today, but same thing. Follow Jesus is step one. And maybe, I don't know, maybe you're cynical. Maybe you're thinking, really, dude? Like, you think that's going to work? I do. I absolutely do. I think it's the necessary starting point. The place to start if you want your marriage to be put back together again. It's not a personality test or some communication tips or romantic evening. Those things are great. But the place to start is by renewing your commitment to being a person who follows Jesus no matter what. Everything you do is a first step. If your job involves typing out emails all day long, what do you got to do when you go to work? You got to turn your computer on. Is that all I got to do? No, but you got to do that if you're going to send your emails. I think about this as students. Students are like, hey, man, how can I get an A? Work harder than you normally do. <laughs> so you're telling me if I work harder, I'm going to get an A? I did not say that. I said, you got to work harder, and then I'll help you understand how to succeed. You know what I mean? Like, there's a starting here. You do this with players, too. I can tell you all you want to know about footwork or stance, but if you're not going to try it, like, what is it? This is the baseline. And remember that obeying Jesus is not some issue of like this slavish do whatever you're told to do just because you're told to do it. No, like Jesus is actively turning you into a new person, inside out loud. He's changing you from the inside out so that you live in such a way that people look at your life and they see God. They see what God is like, right? Let me just say it this way. This is the heart of what I want to say. Jesus is turning us into the kind of people who make marriage work. That's the thing. Jesus is changing us in such a way that we become the kind of people who can do this. So follow Jesus is the starting point. What would it be like if our marriages were filled with two people who lived out the teachings of Jesus, even in just this sermon? What if you were a person who, who did what Jesus said? And, and, and this isn't a new idea. Actually, one of the earliest preachers, John Chrysostom, not earliest, but great early preacher, John Chrysostom, fourth century. He was uh, talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And he was looking back over everything that Jesus has said. And he was making the point that if you commit yourself to these things, then you're going to be able to make marriage work. He said, for if a man is meek, means your power, but your power is under control. He's meek and a peacemaker and poor in spirit and merciful. How would he send his wife away? He says, he who has a habit of reconciling with others, which is what Jesus told us to do. How's he going to remain at odds with she who is his own? Now, I think part of what it means to be a Christian is to acknowledge that Jesus is the first solution to every question about how to make life work. And if you make it your goal to be Jesus to your spouse, your marriage will get better. I think some of what this means is we need Jesus' view of marriage. I think part of what makes marriage so difficult in our world is that we put way too much pressure on it. You know what I mean? We expect it to do everything for us. And I'm not going to lay out a whole theology of marriage. I remember a year ago we did a series called The Other Six Days where I got to lay out a theology of marriage. If you don't remember that or didn't hear that or you need a refresher, you need to know what marriage is, go find it on YouTube. Lay it out for you. But the big idea in the Bible of marriage, I'll be clear, the big idea of Bible is that in the Bible about this is that marriage is designed to look like Jesus. Our love is to reflect his love. It's designed to look like Jesus, but it cannot ever replace Jesus. And this is what's hard about marriage today. I think it's a fairly unique moment in the history of the world where we place a unique pressure on marriage to do one thing. It really only has one purpose socially anymore, and that's to make somebody happy. It's not necessary for me. Like, I can have an income on my own, so can she, but why do I get married? To make each other happy. Are you, like, no, you can't make somebody happy all the time. I can never make Beth happy all the time. She can never make me happy all the time. It's not going to work. And yet, this is the weight we bear on this. Like, marriage makes a wonderful gift, but a terrible God. And maybe you think that's a little dramatic. Nobody's teaching, treating marriage like it's a God. Really? Because I think a decent definition of God is maybe whatever you look to for happily ever after. That's not a bad understanding of God. And if we're looking at marriage as the thing that's going to bring us lasting happiness, this is the solution to my sadness and loneliness, then we'll put a pressure on it that it can never be born. Stop putting your hope in marriage. Put your hope in Jesus. This is part of what it means to follow him first. 
Marriage is a reflection of a God of perfect love. Jesus is the embodiment of a God of perfect love who turns us into the kind of people who can make it work. Follow Jesus. That's the first thing. Second thing, stay married. Here we go again with the two cent advice, you know? And I don't know if you're as cynical as me. I don't know. Maybe you're not. But if I were you, I'd probably think, okay, so if follow Jesus was a little bit too basic, this one's just insulting. I mean, come on. How do I stay married? Stay married. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> and again, is this everything? No, it's not everything. There's a lot more to be said. And if you need help, please come get help. Please come get help. Let me tell you something we all know is true, but don't often do something about, is that we wait too long to try to get help. Sometimes people rail on the church. Well, the divorce statistics are just as bad as the church they are in the world. I don't even know what to do with that. I don't even know if that's true, first of all. But I do know that most of the divorces I've seen in the church could have been stopped. Could have been stopped. Any of them could have been stopped because Jesus is Jesus. But all of them could have been stopped. If they just got help a little early. So get help. Come find us in the lobby. Send us an email this week. Call the church office. My marriage is starting. I need help. We'll get you help. But I'm going to tell you again, right now, like what we need right now, what Jesus gives us is not some detailed advice on all the specifics. What Jesus says is it's kind of like this is a football, right? This is a football. These are the lines. I'm the coach. You're the players. Let's get back to the basics. The secret to staying married, staying married. I can't tell you how many couples, 35, 40, 50 years, are saying, remember when you said that? Like, that's true. That's been the story for us. How did we get here? We got here. And what do we tell young couples when they're getting married? What kind of advice do we give? Usually we'll say something like, hey, don't let divorce be an option. You just say right now that we are going to make this work no matter what, and you'll make it work. And that's true. That's good advice. Keep saying it and follow it. Let's take our own medicine. Because as soon as we stop asking, am I going to stay in this thing? Then we can actually set ourselves about the hard work of serving another person in the name of Jesus. How many times do we tell our kids, never quit? You tell your friends, don't give up. I know you're in the middle of the school program and you're tired, you want to be quit, but don't, don't quit. Like, remember the goal. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't give up. And we say this because we know that the reward will be worth the work. That the pain and the fear of today is actually something we can bear because it's worth it in light of the long run. I think we need to think about this when it comes to marriage and divorce. We get divorced because we're not thinking long enough. We're short-sighted. We're not thinking about the impact it's going to have on us and on our children and on our grandchildren for decades to come. It's not just my opinion. There's a book written in 2002 called Will Divorce Make Me Happy? Written by some non-Christian psychologists who did a bunch of research, and they did all these different tests. And what they found was almost across the board, people who get divorced thinking it's going to make them happier, they did all these sort of psychological tests on the different markers of happiness. Nope, not happier. The same or worse. And not only that, but they discovered across multiple longitudinal studies that uh, couples who are having a hard time, if they'll just stay together, then two-thirds of them, two-thirds of them will be happier in five years if they just stay together. And maybe thinking, yeah, well, like that is, there's another third, right? So those didn't work. I get it. And let me just say, if you do the follow Jesus, then the stay married, it's going to work. And just, I hate, so like I hate when preachers are like, I guarantee, like it just seems cheesy and wrong to me, but... With respect, I guarantee <laughs> that if you follow Jesus, if you set yourself to following Jesus no matter what, I guarantee you, I promise you, that's a better word, I promise you that if you say, both of you, I will follow Jesus as best I possible, I will listen to his teachings and I will do what he's saying and we will stay together. If you follow Jesus and stay married, you will have a better marriage in five years. Probably in one year, probably in six months, man. Perfect? No. Better? Yes, I think it's true. But then we get to a point when we look up to the heavens and we just feel so stuck and you just say, but, but, you sound like our kids, but, 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 but my heart's not in this. Doesn't Jesus care about my heart? Because my heart's not even in this anymore. I just feel like I'm going through the motions. My heart's not here. Yeah, Jesus cares about your heart because he's in the process of changing it. And I don't know if you know this, but the way he changes your heart is by telling you what to do with your body. Like think about the anger thing. The problem is contempt in your heart. So what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to go make peace. You gotta go do something. And in the doing of the something, your heart gets changed. Think about courage. How do we form courage? We just by sitting around and thinking about it? No, by finding ourselves in situations where we want to quit and not quitting. That's how we form courage. And this is how you form a heart that stays married. You stay married. That's why Jesus does what he does. Stay put. Go. Trust me. I can change you. I can do this. I'm capable. Would you just believe in me? Would you just trust that I can do what I tell you I'm going to do? But, but but you don't know what I'm dealing with. No, I don't. I don't, but I do know him. And we do know that with no exceptions, 
You won't have the marriage that you want until you take your eyes off the person sleeping next to you or in the other room maybe and put them on Jesus. I know you can't stand her right now. I know the thought of him makes you sick right now. I know that some of you are sitting by a person and yeah, you have rings that you gave each other, but you don't like each other at all. Like on the way into church, you said maybe to yourself, maybe to him, we're gonna sit together, but you better know I'm still not happy with you or whatever it may be, like we understand. Sometimes this is how life happens, right? I get it. And some of y'all are like, I'm trying not to sweat right now, I'm trying not to move because I don't want anybody to know that I feel this way about my spouse, right? <laughs> Lift your eyes up, man. Let Jesus, let Jesus soften your heart. Let Jesus do some work in you. And maybe, maybe the sin that comes out, maybe you say, okay, yeah, again with the Jesus stuff, it's nice for you, but dude, I live in the real world. I live in my, what you, you don't even understand, come on. And respectfully, no, you come on. If you think you live in a world where looking closely at Jesus and following him doesn't make a practical difference for the relationship that's most important in your life, you come on because you're not living in reality. You live in a lie, you live in a delusional world. You believed a lie that has put you into a prison that you may not escape from if you don't wake up and snap out of it and recognize that Jesus can change, even if it's bad. He is the secret sauce of every relationship. He is, yeah, he's the source, the means, and end of all true love, yes. He's the beginning, middle, and end of everything that it takes to make marriage work. It's about him, but, but, but it's too late for us. You know, it's just too much pain, too many years, it's too late, like it's too far gone. Okay, like again, I don't wanna be disrespectful, but Jesus was dead, D-E-A-D, dead, and then he came back to life. You think he can't do the same thing for your marriage? How do kingdom people make marriage work? Have you met our king? I mean, that's the answer, as simple as that. <laughs> I'm trying to listen to the Holy Spirit and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to listen to what's going on in your lives and I know, I still, I know, I know there are some of you in the room who are like, yeah, y'all can clap, but that's not my home. What if it could be? What if it could be? What if your story could be, I remember this time I thought it was over and then I discovered, I discovered that it wasn't. It was the hardest decision I ever made, but it was the best. What if in 25 years you're finding some goofy preacher out in the lobby saying, let me tell you my story? Because people need to know that if they just trust in Jesus, look to him and stay married, they can make it work. They can make it work. I know this goes against every, almost every instinct that we get from the culture around us. And we don't have time to unpack the cultural narratives that teach us that divorce is a good idea. Ideas like you just decide what's true and right Ideas like you just do what you want, do what makes you happy, don't listen to somebody else, don't listen to some ancient book. Ideas that we could unpack if we had time, we don't. Let me just say, I can't make this decision for you, but for me, I'm gonna reject the worldview that's based on the ideas of a bunch of dead guys and listen to the one that's based on the one who's still alive. It always comes back to the same question, do you trust him, do you trust Jesus enough to take him at his words? Do you believe that he's wise enough and caring enough not to send you down a wrong path? Do you trust him? Follow Jesus. Stay married. Let's pray. Father, you are love. And you created us out of your love and invited us into it. That's why we got married, God. Sometimes the experience of it isn't quite like what we anticipated, hoped, dreamed. Maybe sometimes it's more like what we feared. just entirely dependent on your spirit. Spirit of love in the room changes. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.